Hi there, welcome to your second lecture on the 1980s. And I've got here this list that I started out the last lecture with that I just wanted to remind you of. So you can pause it here if you want to write these things down so that you can be ready to kind of take notes on what this uh, stuff is when uh, when it comes up during the lecture. And I'm going to start out by talking a little bit more about postmodernism and giving you some examples of the change from modernism to postmodernism. In the case of modernism, it's really easy to see how modernist ideas play out by looking at architecture. This is a building called the Lever House, which is in downtown Manhattan, built in the early 1950s, or actually midtown Manhattan, built in the early 1950s for the Lever Brothers Company that makes soap. Um, one of the guiding principles of modernism in general is this concern with the formal qualities of the work of art or architecture itself. In the case of modernist architecture, the uh, and in this case this is an international style architectural work, um, which is kind of modernism. Uh, we haven't talked much about architecture, but this is a good way to see you know this concern with the shape and form and function of a building itself. Uh, or of a work itself is the main concern of modernism. So with modernist with modernist architecture, the exterior um, is stripped down to the plainest possible um, elements. The form of the building itself is revealed by the 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 decoration or lack of decoration on the building. These modernist skyscrapers were built using steel I-beams and a kind of grid-like construction and the the way the building is um, covered in glass is meant to showcase the modern materials that are made to use the building so that if you look at this is Lever House under construction so you can see it's just a basic grid-like structure that's being built level by level um, using steel I-beams here is the building as it was completed and um, as you can see the exterior of the building is quite plain it emphasizes the grid-like structure of the interior supports of the building at night when and you can just see this on the slide on the left when this building was lit up you could see that the building was really um, I mean the walls of the exterior are just glass they don't support the building at all and when the building was lit up at night you could see all the way through the building. You could see it like, in fact, the nickname of this building is the Crystal Lantern because it really is all light when you um, when you turn on the building's interior lights at night, uh, showcasing the formal structure of the building. And that is the main concern of modernism. Uh, as one of the proponents of modernist building, uh, Mies van der Rohe said, less is more. The less decoration, the less complication, the better. You want the building to speak for itself in modernist architecture. Here is the ground floor of Lever House where you can see that basically this entire building is held up by a series of steel piers and those are the piers that people are standing next to and on the ground floor of the building that structure is exposed so that you have those support structures that hold up the entire building and the building seems to float on top of those um, on top of those piers and then all the walls of the the lobby area are made out of glass because they don't need to be supporting the building uh, so form is revealed, the materials themselves are what's celebrated, there's no embellishment, there's no ex extra stuff, there's no attempt to hide the structure of the building, and there's no references to the art historical past or to the architectural past. There's nothing unnecessary on a modernist building. A postmodernist building, by contrast, is going to be somewhat different. Here you have, obviously, Philip Johnson had actually trained at Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Uh, and have worked on the Lieber House building, but when he develops his own practice, this is a building from 1984, used to be called the AT&T building, it's now the Sony building. This is a mock-up of the building. This is post-modern architecture. Modern architecture has nothing extraneous, nothing unnecessary, no embellishments. You can see the entire structure of the building because of the way that the building is put together. Um, form and function and structure are the main formal or um, aesthetic concerns of the building. Here you can see Philip Johnson has gone away from that and has moved towards a more um, playful kind of imagination of a building. So here's a skyscraper that doesn't only look like a skyscraper. Uh, it also looks a little bit like 
a, um, a, a, a dresser, you know, with a fancy broken pediment top. In fact, the use of a broken pediment for the top of the building is also a reference not just to furniture, but also to ancient Greek architecture and that, and to classical world, the classical world, and to the Renaissance world. And so that right there is postmodern because now we're getting unnecessary embellishments and art historical references, the kinds of things you would not find in a modernist building. If you look at the, um, so there's the top of the building, you can see that little keyhole broken pediment up there. You can also see that the windows and the um, coverings of the building are, there's a rhythm to them. The interior of the building, the structure of the building is, is pretty much the same as the interior structure of the lever house, but here you've got a more decorative exterior facade to make um, a different kind of set of patterns and rhythms on the exterior of the building that also sort of reminiscent in some cases of maybe um, um, the drawers in a high boy chest of drawers or something like that. Uh, there on the bottom I've got the lever house where you've got that very plain revealing structure uh, of the, the lobby of the building. On the right, instead of that very plain and stark um, construction that really is, you know, just is what it is. On the right, Philip Johnson has created a still fairly plain, but a lobby area that is referencing other um, other building traditions. This has been compared to a Renaissance church facade like San Andrea. It has been compared to a Roman triumphal arch. It has been compared even to a Romanesque or Gothic um, cathedral entryway. Certainly the Romanesque portal shape is there with that tympanum, implied tympanum area at the top of the um, the glass doorway area, and then you've got the round shape that's reminiscent of a rose window in a Gothic cathedral. So here, this building is no longer extremely plain, less is more. You've got some references to art history or architectural history, and that's the difference, my friends, between the modern and the postmodern. There's another view, so there's Lever House where you can see it's extremely plain, it's revealing the form. Uh, on the right, then, you've got this this much more sort of um, reminiscent of uh, other architectural traditions shape with the main portal entry and then the flanking windows on either side. Not simply revealing the form of the building, but really kind of referencing art history or architectural history. Oh, and there's just Lever House lit up so you can see how, I mean, that's kind of cool in its own way, right? This building is completely supported by those skinny little piers that you can see there at the bottom level. And you can get a sense of how in this modernist building that is the most important thing is revealing the form of the building itself. Similarly, in the 1980s, so you have Philip Johnson with his AT&T building, you also have this building designed by Michael Graves. Michael Graves, architect who now works for, um, all, does some designs for Target as well. This is his Disney headquarters building from the early 1980s. Another example of a postmodern building. And one of the things I mentioned in the last lecture is postmodern buildings, or postmodernists also tend to be playful. So here in the Disney headquarters building, you have art historical references, you have the pediment, um, the temple front, you have, you can just barely make it out here, there's a central rotunda in this building that is reminiscent of the um, Pantheon, for example, or also uh, here Graves is quoting from Palladio, who is a Renaissance era architect as well. Uh, one of the other things that Graves is doing, as you can see, is he's got these little figures of the seven dwarves holding up the pediment there in the um, what would be the architrave of a, a temple front. These are figures that are quoting from Greek architecture. Um, in the Greek world, they're, one of the ways you could have columns is a particular form called a caryatid. Caryatid was like a, a female form um, that would, a female sculpture that would be used as a column. So here you've got these seven dwarves filling in for caryatids on an ancient Greek temple. So the forms and the ideas are quoting from the, the world of art history and then it's also this kind of playful version of that with these seven dwarves as caryatids. And here's um, caryatids from the Erechtheion on the, on the um, um, Acropolis in Athens. Just so you know what it is that Graves is referring to or quoting from. 
Okay, so uh, another artist that we didn't talk about last time, but I wanted to show you today, partly because he fits this postmodernist trend so well, and uh, is this artist Keith Haring, who, um, let's see, his dates are 58, 1958 to 1990. Uh, Keith Haring was a graffiti artist, just as um, just as Jean Jean Michel Basquiat was, and he became known in the Soho area. Um, because he had begun, because he had begun um, tagging buildings and doing this very distinctive style of linear outline graffiti art around town. Here are two amphoras, or um, this is a particular vessel shape, um, uh, vase shape that comes from ancient Greek tradition. That um, instead of so the va the vase shapes come from ancient Greek tradition. The even the coloring comes from ancient Greek geometric pottery. Um, but here he's designed these amphoras with his very distinctive linear outline style of graffiti. And th this is an example of uh, the kind of classic or the kind of ancient world artifact that Herring is riffing off of in those amphoras I just showed you. This is a geometric vase from the 8th century BCE, the very famous Dipilon crater where you can see it's that kind of tan background with a black with black figures on it and in this case also very linear and outliney but um, in this ancient geometric style that Herring is quoting from in those amphoras. Herring does a lot of these outline style drawings or outline style paintings. Here is um, one of his images that's really literally quoting from a painting by Raphael. Uh, you've probably seen those little puti, those little angels by Raphael in lots of different places. They're often reproduced and here he's done them in his own distinctive graffiti style. These are examples of, of course, postmodern painting or postmodern art because it is referencing the art historical world and then turning them into this kind of um, playful, um, this kind of playful stuff and using different media and using kind of lowbrow media in the case of graffiti uh, and Keith Haring. And here's another example of his postmodern art. This is a very graffiti style outline drawing of the crucifixion. And here's a mid 1980s. Um, this is basically in a handball court in Harlem. Uh, Herring was very much of his age. That is, the 1980s is the age where we see an epidemic of crack use in major urban areas. Um, this was a, a, a actually big problem in the 80s, much like crystal meth has become a big problem in the, in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, meth has actually been an, a rural problem and a Western problem just for uh, a variety of reasons, whereas crack, which is a particularly potent form of cocaine, a uh, potent and cheap form of cocaine, was a kind of um, urban phenomenon of the 80s. Uh, actually, the crack epidemic burned itself out because people tended to um, die young, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually a pretty sad story, but the crack epidemic was over because people ended up, um, because of the dangers of using the drug and also the violence associated with, um, with the drug. Uh, so here's, um, so Herring is of his age partly because he is, uh, he's very active, he's an activist. He became um, HIV positive in the 80s and then became an activist, an HIV AIDS activist. Uh, it's hard to remember now because in this country AIDS has really gotten under control and um, of course because so many drugs have been developed that help to prolong the life of people who've been infected with the virus. But in the 80s, I mean this was, it was a, a a scary time and people didn't know, for example, with AIDS, they didn't know if, you know, they didn't know how it was spread, they didn't, and there was a lot of fear, and uh, so Herring is on the cutting edge of activists who are trying to educate people about how to prevent it, um, how to treat it, um, and, how, yeah, and how not to get, how not to get the HIV virus, and unfortunately he did become HIV positive and um, um, died in 1990. Anyway, at any rate, so the, I'm getting off track here. Crack is Whack is this painting he did in a handball court in Harlem where it's uh, commissioned by the city and uh, the wall was painted on both sides with this message to try to educate people and to try to, at a, at a very kind of, you know, um, basic level to um, 
warn people away from the use of crack. And uh, I mean, this was the kind of thing that Herring was partly, one of the things that he's involved in is this kind of public service um, consciousness raising stuff. On the other hand, he also was very into um, the commercial world. You know, he did, uh, he did um, promo spots for MTV, which was at that time uh, a kind of brand new, very hip, very up and coming um, TV network. Uh, so he's very involved on both ends of things. He's both involved in the commercial world and he's also involved in this kind of activist world. This is the other side of the crack is whack wall with this very, you know, typical herring outline style and the use of these short little um, dashes to indicate the idea of movement. Here's an example of one of his uh, poster designs, right, for the AIDS group um, ACT UP. And here's a classic example of Herring's postmodernist um, work. This is a triptych. It's a historic, I mean, triptych is a three paneled um, altarpiece uh, that can be closed. And as you can see here, this, the two side panels, the two flanking panels can be closed and they would conform to the shape of the center panel. This is a, you know, long standing religious form of art that goes well back into the Middle Ages, uh, this kind of altarpiece. And the subject here is a typical subject. You have um, you have the crucifixion in the center, and you have angels um, ascending and falling on either side. So you know, um, typical sort of art historically relevant subjects, but done in his outline linear graffiti style. So it's a classic example of postmodernism combining these two worlds, or combining you know the use of the use of art history with this kind of modern, um, modern uh, style. This church is uh, St. John the Divine in New York City that he designed this altarpiece for. The year after he designed this altarpiece and, and had it created, um, Herring died from AIDS and his funeral was actually held here. Just FYI. What I like is that this is such a good example of postmodernism, just like those amphoras that Herring did. See, here's some sculptures that um, are based on herring designs in the, uh, on display in the Lever building, which I was just showing you earlier. Uh, herring, as I was saying, also did commercial work. So here, and again, like the, like the pop artists, uh, Andy Warhol being primary among them, uh, guys like Herring are not afraid to, you know, work both sides of the aisle, so to speak, to be commercial and to do fine art, to do graffiti and to do commercial art, to do graffiti and high art. You know, these guys move easily among all these different media or all these different um, venues for art. Uh, let's see, a Statue of Liberty from 1986. So here again, this just gives you a good sense of his style. And here, um, you can actually buy these little figurines based on uh, and herring designs of uh, Andy Warhol. So here's his Andy Mouse, combining Mickey Mouse with Andy Warhol and showing Andy, um, Andy Mouse on the uh, dollar bill. So really playing with and riffing on the ideas of commercial success, commercialism, money. You know, one of the things that people always struggle with is this relationship between art and money because even though fine artists sell in galleries and when they become successful like a Schnabel or, Schnabel or a um, Basquiat, you know, their paintings sell for millions of dollars, there's this idea that somehow people who do um, artwork for commercial purposes are somehow impure while fine artists who sell in galleries are pure. You know, there's this fear of the taint of commercialism or something, um, which I think is uh, strange to say the least, you know. I mean, I guess there's this idea that if you're a commercial artist, you're doing things for other people, and if you're a fine artist, you're creating simply for yourself, which, I mean, that's a, a beautiful idea, but, you know, to if you sell your work in a gallery, you're creating it for somebody besides yourself. Anyway, well, I'll get off my soapbox here. I mean, what's interesting with these guys in the 80s is really kind of, you know, thumbing their nose at the distinction between all these different venues. And speaking of that, uh, here's another artist who's a great example of the postmodern trend of the 1980s and the, the kind of guy who challenges all these kinds of distinctions, Mark Kostabi. This is a print called The Big Picture, which, as you can see, is, um, is a kind of 
a gallery or excuse me a studio where you've got photographers you've got painters you've got um, sculptors you've got everything going on here uh, inside this picture and then you've got a guy playing the piano um, and then you've got there on the <laughs> right front of the picture you have a cash register um, Kastabi is particularly interesting because he started in the 80s uh, and again, you have things to read about Kastabi for um, for this week and next week. Um, he started in the 80s and he started uh, promoting himself. And very early on, he create he start he renamed his gallery Kastabi World, kind of referencing Disney World. And he hired a stable of studio assistants who did his paintings for him, and then he would sign them, and then they would sell for lots of money. Uh, he got embroiled in a, a big controversy, as you should have been reading about, because one of his former assistants went off and started selling fake Kastabis, which the assistant was signing and then passing off as Kastabis. Um, and so Mark Kastabi himself had to go try to authenticate or validate which paintings were really by, by Kastabi. And I put that in quote marks, basically, because... You know, if it's just signed by the artist and it's not created by the artist, when you know when do you cross that line? Now, of course, Kastabi was really playing with the idea of the art as investment and the brand name artist. And you know, actually, if you go back through history, you'll find that a lot of the paintings that we revere as being done by Leonardo or by this Renaissance artist were actually done by many people. And then, you know, a few details painted in by the, the brand name artist and then s sort of, you know, stamped by the brand name artist or his work coming out of his workshop. So Kastabi wasn't doing anything new, but he was highlighting this kind of strange relationship between art and money that people are so hung up about. And in fact, Kastabi still has, um, <laughs> he's still doing all this. You know, he has a cable show in New York called Name That Painting, where he gives away prizes to people who name his most recent paintings it's usually like 50 bucks or something but you know I'm playing on the whole idea of the art world carnival basically he also has a column on art news that I highly recommend you read it's a it's basically how to be a successful artist in the New York gallery world and it may seem cynical but it also is really kind of interesting commentary on the current state of the art world so I think he's a he's a pretty interesting guy uh, he also is a great example of postmodernism. Here is a painting he did in 2007 where you can see he's referencing all sorts of, um, of art from the, the recent past, uh, including, you should probably recognize the uh, bicycle wheel by Marcel Duchamp. There's also a painting by Mondrian hanging there. There is a sculpture by Picasso that bull's head that's made out of a bicycle seat and bicycle um, handles. There's an Alexander Calder mobile. Um, that little kind of crazy looking guy floating down there is, but as um, referencing a very recent artist, a guy named um, uh, Murakami, who we'll be looking at here in a couple weeks, who's still around. Um, the figure who's got that noose around its neck sitting precariously on the bicycle wheel, wheel is drinking a Campbell soup. Um, so referencing Andy Warhol. So here you've got this kind of um, smorgasbord of art historical references, and then you've got this kind of crazy scenario where it looks like this guy is getting ready to kick the bicycle wheel out from underneath himself and commit suicide. Um, so, you know, this is typical of the postmodern uh, approach to art making. Here's another uh, earlier painting by Kastabi, Forbidden Fruit, where you've got this shadowy figure coming in and stealing the fruit out of the paintings in the museum. Uh, again, a, a jokey and yet art historically referential uh, work. Counterintelligence from 1996, where you can see this is, again, commentary on the whole like art market. You've got a, a, li a line of people with their shopping carts, and they're pulling stuff off the shelves that they're going to buy, all sorts of references in this to um, classics of 20th century modernism. You've got Alberto Giacometti. You've got Marcel Duchamp. You've got Andy Warhol. Um, let's see, Pete Mondrian, uh, Man Ray. Uh, there's all kinds of, of classics of 20th century art that are referenced here, and people are just ripping them off the shelves and going to buy them. So, you know, it's a, a, jo a, a joke, really, about the um, commodification of art. 
Here from 1981, his automatic painting, where you can see, uh, let's see, there in the background you've got uh, an artist drawing stuff. He's feeding it into this machine, and you can just see here there's a color mixer, and then there's a series of, you can choose uh, different art historical influences, from Byzantine to Renaissance to Rococo to Impressionism to mall art, and then these colors being mixed and painted by machine. Uh, this is another one of the things that Kostabi's playing with. Not only do you have the postmodernist thing going on here, but also the whole idea of um, creativity and originality and um, the value of the artist's name, which is so um, important in the, the modern art market. And then finally, here's a recent painting, too, that I really like by Kostabi. The father of our country brings ketchup to the Prado. All right, so let's see. You've got the CBS and New York Times icons referenced there in the background of the painting. There is also um, George Washington in the background of the painting. And you have in the foreground um, a bottle of ketchup, Heinz ketchup. You've got the uh, a, a skyscraper there replacing the painting. This is a reference to a very famous painting by Diego Velasquez called um, Las Meninas, which is a portrait of the... Um, the Spanish royal princess from the 16th century. Very famous painting. It's in the Prado, by the way. If you're going on that trip this summer, um, you'll be able to see it in the Prado. Um, so here's Kostabi's take on that, which is combining art historical references with pop culture references with political commentary. Okay? So there's a, co a comparison. You can see where he's gotten his... Um, composition from where he's referencing very, very specifically and, and quite accurately the um, the composition of Las Meninas by Velázquez, um, but he's replaced the figures with these figures that, and um, images that are making some sort of commentary on the news cycle, uh, American culture, American politics, um, and, and so on. So very much the sort of postmodern scene. And here's another, this is the after picture. Remember, I was just showing you that um, delicate balance and cruel passion. So here, the stool has been kicked out from under him, and the figure has um, has committed suicide. So again, this kind of uh, strange mishmash of art history here that is uh, so postmodern and so typical of Kostabi, and also, again, commentary on the modern state of the art world.